Welcome to A Voice With Colour and the rugged beauty of Inishowen. I'm on a journey painting my way from Dublin to Donegal. Along the way I'll be meeting people who want to paint and capture the Irish landscape in watercolours. Today I'm touring Ireland's most northerly peninsula, Inishowen. It's a place with a colourful past getting its name from Owen, son of King Nile of the Nine Hostages, way back in the 5th century. Then came the Spanish Armada, and later still it became a sanctuary for the British and American fleet during the First World War. Now, however, the welcome is for holidaymakers who come here in search of sandy beaches, spectacular mountains and a way of life that has changed little over the centuries. One man who keeps coming back here time and time again is well-known broadcaster Jerry Anderson. Today I'm taking him home in style. Well I suppose in a way Jerry coming down to Inishowen for you is like coming home. It is like coming home because I feel as if I'm from here, more than Derry actually, which is probably an odd thing to say. But my mother's from here. She was born about four or five miles over, as they say, that away. So I spent a lot of my childhood down here, actually most of my childhood down here, at a very peculiar time. It was around about, well, I suppose the late 50s and so on. Yeah. I was quite small then, I'm still quite small. But uh, every night, maybe two, no, about two or three nights a week, you'd go to someone else's house, they would, they would, they would bake stuff, be a lot of potchy, be a lot of men with fiddles. A lot of women flying about dancing, a lot of men singing in their caps. They used to sit there and they sing in their cap in their lap and they'd speak the last line. And it was great. I mean, it was so marvellous. And the people loved, they loved music and they, they loved language and they loved telling stories and they loved funny things. They, they wouldn't tell jokes, you know, they never tell jokes. They used to get a great kick of someone who said something clever. Well, I suppose then having so, such close contacts with an area that had a musical culture, it wasn't such a big transition for yourself then to move into a musical career. No, it wasn't actually because music was around you all the time here. But you moved into, into the show band scene then yeah. and you became a musician yourself in a band and yeah. from there into a rock band yeah. and travelled to America. How That's did that right. all come about then? Well, you see, uh, one of the marvellous things about Derry basically what, when I was going up was that, you know, you were on the brew, you were on the door. So you had nothing else to do. It was almost like, you know, the only thing you could make money out of was, uh, was music or, or football. As a normal rule of things, most people drop out of university to get involved in music. You dropped out of music to go to university. Yeah, I, I did do all the way around, <laughs> yeah. I ended up in a, a rock band in America and, and Canada. It was a fairly, let's put it this way, fairly hard way of life, yeah. you see. So after about two years or so, I, again, I was getting close to about 30 years old, you yeah. see, that kind of time. When you know you're not going to be a big star, you see, in that, in that kind of business. So I kind of looked around me and said, oh, you know, this is great crack, but you know, you can't go on. You'll die if you go on like this. So you went to university, yeah. you got your degree, mm -hmm. and then from there you moved into broadcasting of all things. How did that, what was the interest there? Well, when I got a degree, you see, I realized I was qualified for no profession whatsoever. 
So uh, I just kind of, I got this job as a, an editor in a community magazine and I didn't know anything about it. I called my way into it. The guy, very, very nice when he gave me a job. So uh, I got a phone call the first day I was there. I was there trying to figure out how the thing worked. You know, I was bluffing my way, basically said, yes, ah, oh, printing press, yes, typewriter, oh, yeah. oh, the editorial, oh, this kind of thing. And it was a local ra BBC radio station asked me to do an interview and I said, uh, no. And they said, why? I said, because I don't know anything about this. And they said, do it. You know, I said, okay. I said, but don't ask me any hard questions about editorial policy, reach, all this kind of stuff, you know. They said, okay, we won't ask you anything. So I went down to the studios and they asked me all the questions. I told them not to ask them. So I couldn't. It was live, of course, and I, I just lied. <laughs> <laughs> so I just sat and spoke for about 20 minutes about things I knew nothing about. Yeah. And then afterwards, the producer came over to me and I said, listen, I'm sorry about that. She said, sorry? Why? I says, I, I made all that up. She said, what? I said, that's all lies. I mean, he said, what? He says, you might be good at this. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, this is a terrible thing to say, but maybe perhaps, you know, the best way to become a uh, broadcaster is to display the ability to lie fluently. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, to a large extent, you succeeded at your musical career. Mm. You went to university. You moved into broadcasting. Tell me this. Have you ever painted before? Oh, no, no. No, when I was at school, my art teacher took me aside one time and he actually said to me, he said that I was so bad, I was special. I had a kind of a non-talent. No, really, I was so bad. I couldn't, I couldn't even draw a stick man. Yeah. Whenever they used to, you know those potatoes, you had to half the potatoes make shapes of, I used to smudge those. <laughs> no, I, I, I was really awful. I was yeah. really awful. No talent at all. Well, I always say, Jerry, there's no such thing as a bad student. There's only bad teachers. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to change that for you today and take you down to this beautiful beach down at Lenin Strand. Okay. That's probably the difference between you and I, Dermot. I would look at this as scenery in a general sense, but you would pick out the contrasts and with an artist's eye, which I, I, I don't have. I mean, it would seem to me there'd be problems here. Yeah. Oh, well, there's going to be problems with every painting that you do. But, you see, the, the worst thing you can do is come out to a beach, especially in Ireland, because most people, whenever they think of beaches, they think of beach balls, children, buckets and spades and all this mm. carry on. But there are hundreds of beaches around this coast and there's not, not a soul to be seen anywhere. So it can be a boring painting. So what do we need to make it you know, a more interesting painting. Not a Japanese in general. <laughs> <laughs> it occurs to me. <laughs> so what do we, now, yeah. seriously, what do we need here? Because yeah. it occurs to me, look at that, that, that mountain, right? That's changing all the time. There's yeah. different shadows. I mean, if, I was, if you were asking me to paint that, and I say, right, and I'm painting that, suddenly it changes. That's right. How do you deal with that? What you do is you grab an image in your mind, and you see it, you know, and you think to yourself, what's up there? We have, you know, greenery in the foreground in the mountain, and then it, gets, it fades as it goes away. Yeah. And as the landmass recedes into the distance there, you can see that it gets blued. So what we're going to do is grab an image, hold it in our head, and try and get it down on the paper as quickly as possible. So no, you're not painting what you actually see, you're painting what you have. You're using this as a guideline, but the colours and the shades, you've got a, an, an idea in your head yeah. before you actually start. We have a lovely seascape going across here in the distance and cutting off by the background hills and then the beach is leading our eye right down we have the line of the watermark the line of the tide mm -hmm. and that's bringing us right into the corner and you see the way in the corner the dark water on the beach reflects the darkness of the mountain yeah. behind yeah that's something we're going to try and capture so what i'm going to do without any further ado is hand over the pencil and i'll show you where to get started here After the sky, Jerry, we moved down here to the beach, yeah. and we wanted to put in the underlying colour of the sand. Yeah. Now, you put that in more or less in stripes, just moving across, bringing the wash down as we went along, and that's known as a flat wash. Mm -hmm. And that's just to give that underlying colour. And if you look along the water's edge, you can see that you have a very light, sandy colour. But then, as we move back up the beach, the sand begins to get darker. Yeah. And a different colour altogether. So, what we want to do now that this first wash is dry, is put the same colour over the top of this wash again. That's a mixture of raw sienna with crimson. 
mm. and water. Okay. And we're coming across along this bottom pencil line that we have for the tide line. So off you go. Okay, right. Now, the same, the same way as before, only coming to the second